and everything you've studied with the dinosaurs, what have you learned about the evolution of life on Earth, that mechanism? It's it's really good. <laughs> it, sound, it sounds obvious, but it's, I, I think the bit that still fries my brain is just like the raw numbers, because I think we're very bad at considering, like, I regularly talk about, oh, this is 70 million years old, but this is 78 and this is 104. And people are just like, oh my God, how on earth do you deal with those numbers? And I don't. They're just numbers because I can't conceive of it really any better than you can. They're, they are astronomical. Yeah. Last Thursday was quite a long time ago. 66 million years is mind boggling. Like I, I, I can't fathom it. Um, but that's it. I think the evolution thing is, A, my suspicion is quite a lot of it happens. It's not quite Stephen Gould's punctuated equilibrium, but I think stressful events probably prompt a lot more than less stressful events. You know, you know population crashes and all these things that then odd things survive and then that's changing your genetic component and all the rest of it. But you've, you've just got to remember that it's just, it's almost a numbers game. Um, yeah. you know, it's that bad analogy of like, oh, evolution is just rolling dice and hoping you get all sixes. And it's like, no, a friend of mine said, no, it, it's rolling dice, but it gets to keep the sixes. I and mean, then suddenly getting a hat full of sixes isn't that hard. But also you're in the context of even rare species, you know, ultra rare, I'm short of stuff that like we've nearly killed off, but like very rare species have populations in the thousands or hundreds of thousands and are probably around for hundreds of thousands of years and very few you know other than a few things like whales and apes and elephants mostly have dozens or thousands of offspring at a time so a few thousand animals that have a few thousand offspring at a line for a few hundred thousand years yeah it's billions and billions and billions of them mm -hmm. that, that. And that's the rare stuff. You look at Mola Mola, the ocean sunfish, though I think though I think Mola has just been split up into like five species. It's one of the weirdest looking animals. It's, love it, love it, love it, love it. I mean, what a what a fish that is. <laughs> Swims with a giant dorsal and I think it's a giant anal fin, and then they flap alternatingly. Does it have a face? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little one at the front. Eat jellyfish. Super open oceanic, and they get really big. You see that one with the diver. But I think these are the record breeders for animals, and they have something like a hundred million eggs at a time. Whoa! Don't quote me on that, but it is something in those kinds of numbers. So yeah, that's you don't need a very large population of sunfish <laughs> to start having an awful lot of numbers. Are you going to Google it and see if you can find it? Uh, number of eggs or something? Yeah. 300 million. Oh, I undercut a, a single undercut it. <laughs> a single female can release up to 300 million eggs at one time during a spawning event. Boy, these eggs are incredibly small, measuring about 1.3 millimeters in diameter. That's still a lot of That's eggs, still, when, when you think about it. It's not that small. <laughs> yeah, right, 300 million of, of one mil is still quite a bit. Uh, fertilization is external. Females yeah, release their eggs in. into the water where males then fertilize them. Wow. Man, there's a lot of different ways to have sex, I guess. This is <laughs> Yeah. But 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 that's that's the bit of evolution that I think I understand why people don't get it. We are mostly talking about millions in population times millions of years times thousands of offspring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and it's kind of a numbers game. Well, how could this evolve? Well, the right selective pressure and when you've got 100 billion offspring, probably a few of them have that. And when you focus in on a single species and trace its history, you can see how effective evolution is, natural selection is, and then you just have to like go across species. And yeah, you know, but it, but it's also a massive compromise, which is the bit that people always miss. You know, it's Darwin's line: it's descent with modification. Yes, over time you can end up with extraordinarily weird things, but mostly what's happening is you're changing something fairly simple. Yeah. You're you're making edits to the existing plan um which is why you don't have animals with tentacles they they have legs which have joints which have fingers and they all have one bone then two bones then a bunch of little blocky bones and then a few more and then the little ones that make up the digits for hands and feet and basically everything has that 
because you're modifying that pattern. And occasionally you get something weird like um, most of the modern lungfish have basically reduced those down to, well, they, they had a more simple plan to begin with, but reduced it down to a stump and then they've got something like a flaily tentacle. But yeah, you know, or snakes have got rid of them or the various legless lizards and things like that. And again, Cecilians and um, all the rest. But yeah, it you, you're subtly changing certain things in certain ways is mostly what's going on and then those build up over time but also against that compromise of there's things that do and don't work there's things that are interlinked and so you can't modify a without modifying b modifying a will kill you therefore b never modifies because the two are genetically linked in some way or yeah like the compromise of the lion's mane making it darker makes you sexier but more likely to kill you 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 I think people think evolution is like perfecting things in some way, and they're not. They're, they're bodge jobs. You know, that's why we have a blind spot in our eye, but things like squid don't. But that process nevertheless does have inventions in it. You have Tiktaalik, you have a fish that learns to breathe, that crawls yeah, but out. It, but it already had a swim bladder that it was probably processing a minimal amount of oxygen through, and the swim bladder evolved for a certainly different function. Yeah, but that's one of the powerful things yeah. about uh, uh, yeah, evolution. It's, it's, it switches yeah. the function. Yeah, it develops it for one function, but once you once you get there, you're like, oh, okay, this could be used for another function. That that leads to something that we, in retrospect, can see as a major invention, which is. A yeah, fish yeah, that's yeah. able to crawl on land, and all yeah, of a sudden we absolutely. have we have uh, cities and yeah, and rockets and uh, yeah, Tiktaalik specifically. Like, there's something really like mind boggling about a fish that crawls out of the sea, and you're just the image of that. Yeah, but it, again, we, you've got stuff that's not a million miles away from that. You have things like frogfish, which are fully marine but kind of clamber through seaweed and stuff and they've got pseudo functional limbs so again because it's that tiktaalik is not a weirdly derived frogfish but it's not like it's a fish that suddenly came on land or a fish that suddenly evolved legs there was already that selective pressure that was pushing it into a new opportunity which gave it and and then on and on and on and that's what keeps going but it also brings up another thing, going back to dinosaurs um, and the behavior stuff, which again, I think has been a problem, is um, the functionality thing and how there's always been, I think, this big perception of single traits having single functions, which isn't how a huge amount of biology works. For some, yeah, like eyes are used for seeing, they don't really do anything else. Um, but I think there's a lot of, again, it comes down to a lot of the sexual selection stuff, but things like horns on triceratops. That's probably quite good for fighting off predators, but it's also quite good for fighting other triceratops. Mm -hmm. And then things like elephants dig with their tusks, as well as fight other elephants, as well as fight lions, as well as stripping the bark off trees. So you've you got to be very careful about how you think of functionality in two different ways. One way is what possible things could that thing do and what possible things could have been the main selective pressure before. So you think about elephant tusks, as I say, they do all these different things. But when an elephant's just got the, the tiniest elephant. little nubs, like the first elephant whose teeth are growing the wrong way and have pushed out of its jaw and now it's got a couple of little spikes, it can't really dig a hole with them. It's certainly not digging for water. They're probably not great against a predator because you'd basically have to get on your knees to try and lean over and try and stab it a bit. But you can show off to the girls and you can immediately fight another elephant who's head to head the same height as you and you've got a massive advantage. So evolutionarily, they probably started as some kind of sexually selected feature. But now, functionally, they are probably compromised by the fact that having the best fighting tusks, but also having the tusks that are best at digging up water to keep you alive during a drought is putting selective pressure on that. Mm -hmm. And those are, although selection, sexual selection appears in both ends, those are two different things. Digging for water is critical, but it's probably not what started it. And I think that's where we get trapped with things like, say, the paddle tail of Spinosaurus or stuff like, or, you know, or T-Rex arms. It's like, well, why are T-Rex arms like that? Well, maybe we need to consider what a slightly longer arm is like or what it was being functioned for in its ancestors or how it works in other species or what else it might do rather than every paper is like, did it do this or did it do this or did it do this? It's like, you know, it could be all of them. Mm -hmm. 
that, that's a very different question to try and answer, but people don't tend to think of it. And it, it ends up being very binary. And again, biology is not like that because it's a compromise. And it may be wiser to then look at the evolutionary origins, how it first sprung up. Yeah, if you, yeah, you know, what, what does a miniaturized version of this look like and what might that function for or, or how does it function in ancestral forms? You know, a, a really good example of that is giraffe necks, which have been argued about, you know, forever and a day it was giraffe necks are to help them feed up high. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, there's a couple of papers coming out going, actually, maybe it's sexual selection and competition. Mm -hmm. And then that drove down into arguments about, well, what does a short neck look like in the Akapi, its nearest relative, and what do short legs look like, and how do they work, and plus a whole bunch of other studies, and ultimately it came out that we were right the first time. This is all about feeding, but it's a really interesting way of thinking about it and looking at it.